Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Noah Meir, and I am the CEO of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy. We are very excited to host the Charney Forum's first public and digital panel. A key feature of the digital revolution is the unprecedented volume of information, which has caused a disruption in most, if not all, aspects of our lives, including in the field of diplomacy. The global crisis created by COVID-19 exacerbates this disruption, increasing the need to address challenges created by this new reality. The diverse content offered by the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy in partnership with the University of Haifa provides practical skills and tools to navigate the information overload and play an active role in the evolving international arena. Our tailor-made seminars and workshops are targeted at participants from civil society organizations, the public sector, multinational corporations, faith-based organizations, students, and professionals. Here with us today, I'm very happy to have Ms. Tilly Charney, who spearheaded the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy a year and a half ago, on the tail end of the previous era in an aspiration to elevate the communication between people internationally. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to draw your attention to a link that will be sent in the chat box. We would appreciate if you could please take two minutes to respond to the questions before logging off. And now for the part you've all been waiting for. With us today are five outstanding thought leaders, each in their own right. I could spend at least an hour introducing and interviewing each of them, but due to time constraints, I will introduce, I will introduce them briefly and hopefully they'll forgive me. They have also promised to keep their answers short and I will make sure of that. There will be 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please write your questions in the chat. We will review and, and ask a select few. Each of our distinguished speakers comes from a different area of expertise. New diplomacy, international relations and geopolitics, journalism, medical field, and philanthropy. Ambassador Ido Aroni, chairman of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy, a global distinguished professor at NYU and former Israeli consul general in New York, will focus today on the prism of new diplomacy. Ambassador Dan Shapiro, distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, will present a perspective of international relations and geopolitics. The fabulous Yael Avi, representing the, is representing the prism of media, award-winning Israeli-American journalist, broadcaster, and lecturer. Professor and Dr. Rivka Karmi, pediatrician and geneticist, former president of Ben Gurion University, first woman to be appointed president of an Israeli university, and hopefully not the last. Dr. Carmi will address the questions from an academic and medical viewpoint. And last but not least, Yariv Zultan, Principal Consultant at GlobalCan, Strategic Solutions for Nonprofits. Yariv will focus on the aspect of philanthropy. Without further ado, I'd like to ask the first question. I'd love if each and every one of you could briefly share some thoughts about the implications of COVID-19 on what we define tonight as your area of expertise. Uh, the big question is, do I trust my government? Do I trust my political leader? Do I trust my Facebook? Do I trust my LinkedIn? And so on and so forth. Uh, the biggest thing that will happen in my view, and I've written about it, is uh, we will, we're already seeing the beginning of a clash that will take place between two forces. The first is the force that will say, listen, the universe was trying to tell us something. Let's take a time out. Let's relax. Let's try and understand the implications. And they will obviously push, those forces will push for what we call responsible consumption. They will push for a more robust climate change conversation. They will link, correlate the COVID-19 crisis to the, um, the climate change crisis. Obviously, they will push for predictive uh, medicine and customized treatment. I'm sure that Professor Carmi will be able to talk about that. And obviously, when it comes to international relations, they will advocate for a more collaborative form of international relations. And then on the other hand, you'll have the old forces that will try to quickly resume the old order. They will say, um, what do you want? The, before COVID-19, the world experienced unprecedented prosperity. Let's resume that very, very quickly. And they will put the blame on globalization, on global travel, it's already happening as the main agent for the spread of the pandemic. Because if you look at places that were not frequented by travelers like Egypt or even Israel, Israel was not hit hard in international standards by COVID-19. And one of the reasons is because we are so acutely and chronically underperforming when it comes to 
incoming tourism. Um, so that's my two minutes. Thank you. Ambassador Shapiro. Uh, thank you, Noah, and uh, thank you uh, to Tilly Charney, and thank you to Ido, and to you for uh, gathering us and for uh, everything that the, the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy is undertaking. Um, I think the uh, probably biggest impact of COVID-19 in the sphere of international relations uh, is to accelerate a trend that was already underway, uh, which was the uh, uh, establishment of a almost new bipolar order or the emerging uh, bipolar order of uh, the United States and China. Uh, when I came to Israel as a US ambassador in 2011, uh, there was absolutely nobody, or almost nobody, anybody in Washington or in the Obama administration that I worked with that talked about China the way now everybody talks about China. And that's since about 2015, 16, and increasingly every year. And when I say everybody, both parties, uh, the military, the intelligence services, the business community, uh, it's, this is not, the think tanks, this is not a, a point of debate anymore, that China is a rising uh, power uh, trying to uh, uh, chip into the influence of the status quo power, you could say, the United States. That was already clearly true in Asia uh, because of China's uh, ability to, to throw its weight around there. Uh, the United States has allies and military presence in Asia, but increasingly it's true uh, in Africa, in uh, Latin America, and even in Europe, uh, as China, through its economic prowess, the Built and Road uh, Initiative, uh, and the presence and influence, uh, soft power as well, that that brings uh, gradually uh, becomes more relevant uh, in those countries and even challenges uh, those countries' relationships with the United States. And it's especially been true in technology, where China is an emerging, uh, trying to emerge as a technology rival to the United States in the critical areas of 5G, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computers, semiconductors, and the like, uh, and almost trying to carve out a, a separate uh, sphere of influence of countries that will work with Chinese systems, uh, such as the ones produced by Huawei, which is seen as a, a threat to, to American uh, primacy in this area. That was all true uh, before anyone heard of COVID-19. Now you have, of course, the fact that the virus seems to have uh, emanated initially from China. Uh, China was not fully transparent about that. The United States government, as it struggles with its own response, it's very poor, and I won't get into that now, has chosen a tactic of trying to gather countries to blame China and to uh, tap against that uh, Chinese influence international institutions like the World Health Organization. Uh, and the chance of this really accelerating uh, a, 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 a dynamic in which countries are simply going to have to choose, will they line up with the United States or will they line up with China when those choices can be very, very painful. And Israel is facing that. I think they heard about this today from Secretary of State Pompeo. Uh, is an accelerated process uh, due to COVID-19. Thank you. Yael. Um, yes, hey there, Noah Meir, and thank you to the Ahmed Charney Forum also for having me on this panel. Such a pleasure and an honor to be on with all of you. Um, I come from the sphere of journalism, and I think one of the um, main things that we saw throughout the last several months, let, let's say the last three months in the Western world, when it comes to um, COVID-19 coverage is that I, I at least hope, because just to give you a little bit of background, I've been a journalist for 25 years. I worked for ABC News, both in the States and in Baghdad back in the Iraq war days, then Sky News in the Middle East, later on I-24 News. So I've seen news evolve, even pre the digital age and into the flurry of highway of information, tweeting mania that we're in today. And I think one thing that COVID-19 proved and uh, is that I do believe that the next generation of content consumers or students, I also teach at the IDC, let's say students or my, my generation of students who are 22, will completely cease to consume what we know as mainstream media. Because we saw, sadly, and don't worry, I'll get optimistic in a minute, but sadly, <laughs> we saw so much um, uh, panic porn, pardon my French, is what we like to call it in television jargon, being thrown at people within a situation where a large group of people, nations, and especially civilians, need to know, I don't even want to say the truth, it's such a loaded um, piece of information, but yes, need to know what is going on and need to know that information that is getting to them is verified. That did not happen in most places. I'm speaking to you from Israel right now, 
one of the things that really concerned me through the COVID-19 coverage in Israel specifically is the um, uh, delivery of prime minister's speeches without the infiltration of journalists, even in pandemic days on national television and three primetime channels, which in where I come from of uh, the School of Ethics of Media, one can argue is actually not the um, something that a free press or a democratic press should do. And that gets me to the next point. That's where editors and fact checking and sources are so important in the digital age. I do believe that what we will see is more of a move to citizen journalism that definitely flourished throughout the last three months, I would say, in Western media. We also have learned that, by the way, we knew about this in October, even the media did, that's another point, when information was coming out of China, but you could barely see that on Western media. So those are things that need to change that I think people behind the scenes are realizing, as well as the need to follow some code of ethics, at least the democratic press ethics, for the next pandemic or the next crisis. I think my two minutes are up. Thank you. Professor Dr. Carmi. Yeah. Um, first, really, congratulations to the uh, Chinese Forum and to Tzili. And thank you very much for considering me to join this wonderful team. Um, since I'm representing both medicine and academia, I would like to refer and address uh, um, uh, actually a common huge um, implication to both community and this is the enormous facilitation of digitalization and automation for uh, those two. Uh, in fact, both for the academia and medicine, the technological revolution has started um, uh, you know, a couple of years before the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so it is based on, on uh, on, on data, on, uh, on man-machine interface, on intelligence, or better yet, augmented intelligence. All of that has already been incorporated both in medicine and academia. But during the six, the, those six months, you know, the leap is really unimaginable. As they say, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and in fact, uh, the need to remote medicine and, and autonomous solutions to both patients in hospitals and in the community really brought about hundreds, hundreds of new uh, apps, prototype of robots, medical devices, and other modalities that are needed to um, uh, take care of the various issues, some of them um, um, un unimagined, unimagined needed uh, um, with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and this is actually going to really change dramatically. Uh, the, uh, the way uh, medical service is being provided to the, uh, to the community. It is going to be much more patient, community-centered, uh, and a lot of uh, remote and uh, virtual medicine, and we see it already. And um, as I said before, it is a need now, but the patient now realize that it is much more accessible, so the service is much more accessible, and I dare say, they are going to be eventually less expensive. So accordingly, the, the traditional uh, hospitals, the, the traditional structure of general hospitals is going to change dramatically as well. Uh, when we come to the academia, um, and um, it was already in the mix when uh, the COVID-19 started, but then within one night, they had to move over to remote learning and, um, and to virtual kind of, uh, of study. Um, I think this is going to be um, a huge disruption to, to academia. Even now, there are already degrees being granted online by uh, virtual universities or big universities that have those platforms. But starting now, every university will have it. And the question is, how the university campus is going to be to change, how the whole culture, the whole basic perception of academia and university, how is it going to be the same? I think it's going to be very different. It, it might take some time, but what we are seeing that right now is going uh, a, a absolutely to change. Um, there are a lot of promises. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're just really, I'm really sorry to interrupt you and you can continue yeah. later on. Sentence just, you know, there are a lot of premises, but also very many perils to the situation. I just want to say that's the least favorite part of my job, and I apologize for that. Yuri. <laughs> Doi, Noam, thank you for, for having me here tonight. It's a pleasure. 
uh, when I received the invitation, I, I noticed I'm marking exactly 25 years in this business. My first position was in May 95 as head of resource development at the Technion, and they got 20 years later as vice president of the University of Haifa. So now coming back to the university under the Chani Forum is, is, is a great honor for me. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I think that our ship is sailing through uncharted and troubled waters. This crisis is of international dimension, not only medically and financially, but also philanthropically. In any financial crisis, philanthropy is being affected immediately. We are witnessing serious cutbacks and redesignation of pledged gifts towards food campaigns and medical and sanitary supplies, which is commendable, but usually comes at the expense of other philanthropically supported causes from preventing domestic violence to therapeutic treatment uh, to children with special needs. In Israel, about 85% of NGOs report a serious reduction of provided services in welfare, health, and education, to name just a few impacted areas. 40% of NGOs report serious shortage of volunteers due to the lockdown and due to the fact that many volunteers belong to at-risk populations who need to stay home. Four of every 10 NGOs, please listen very carefully, four of every 10 NGOs estimated recently they would need to close down, which is not only a terrible loss for the served communities, we need to remember that the NGOs are about 15% of the labor market, which means additional increase in unemployment, a terrible vicious circle indeed. Among funders, both Israelis and global philanthropists, there is great concern about the lack of governmental approach to the rising social issue. Many ask themselves how long can philanthropy alone supply the needed funding for the social sector, which is being left behind until now. My advice is that all stakeholders should pay attention to the social sector, which says our society at large is collapsing and it will have huge social, but also financial implication, all of us as citizens and as, as uh, taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. So to the next question, from a two month perspective, which is Obviously, still not a long enough perspective. We're still very much in the midst of it. But could you please, each of you, share one example of a successful course of action and one of a failed course of action in the handling of the crisis? Again, each from your own prism. And we'll start now with you. I promise not to interrupt, Dr. Carmi. Thank you. Uh, obviously, I'm going to comment about Israel, but I do have one. Uh, one general um, insight about the situation, and this is that the COVID-19 was, was and is not a medical crisis per se. We cannot envision it as a medical crisis because medicine know how to handle with disease, old or new. This is, after all, their bread and butter, uh, you know, and, and so as is, this is not uh, a medical uh, crisis. Um, it, is, it is a crisis, um, of, you know, handling and managing a very complex kind of uh, uh, crisis, very complex, complex kind of uh, um, catastrophic event. And in this, that regard, um, um, we were not prepared. We were not well prepared. So the idea of the, uh, of the government to begin with was that we have to, as, as much as possible, prevent from widespread mass, um, 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 mass infections. So the mantra was flattening the curve, and indeed we managed to flatten the curve, meaning the curve of positively, um, uh, positive um, results, not necessarily sick pe people, because most of them, as we know, are, were very mildly affected, and but the cost was was enormous. the the uh, the cost of flatten, flattening the curve of really relating to the general population rather to the population at risk was very very expensive. To begin with, we knew two things. Only two things at the beginning were very very clear. First, that we have a population at high risk which are the elders and the one with background medicine, uh, um, uh, ailment, with disease, and the medical personnel who needed to be uh, watched very carefully. And all the ones dealing with corona, which were very well, uh, but the others that were also absolutely exposed 
um, uh, I mean, in the front. So, and that was not very well headed uh, to the point where um, if we would have enough ventilators, and we do have enough ventilators, we could end up not having enough stuff. The staff were uh, in isolation, in isolation at home because they were not very well defended. So on the one hand, you know, as a result, we were one of the countries where we had the, the lowest uh, severely infected and ventilated and death. But on the other hand, I think we didn't handle well those uh, communities that are in high risk. Thank you. Ambassador Shapiro. Still muted, I think. Ah, here we go. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, unlike any other we've seen, well, not unlike, but certainly more acute than any we've seen, is a crisis that requires international response and knows no borders. I mean, we have other such problems. We have climate change. Uh, we have migration waves. Uh, we have, uh, have had other epidemics. But uh, this is the, certainly the most acute version of a crisis that knows no borders. And you can't address it on an individual country by country basis. Um, and ultimately, one of the things we know about international crises and international responses to crises is that when the United States leads, it generally uh, can uh, bring along much of the international community. And uh, that's the way these problems get addressed effectively at the international level. And when the United States is absent from that leadership role, it's very difficult to put in place a truly effective international response. In this case, I think we can say the United States has failed to organize uh, any kind of international response. It's been very focused, of course, on its own internal mismanagement and the various shortages of equipment, uh, both medical equipment and testing facilities, et cetera. Uh, and it has largely ignored the needs uh, of other countries or the degree to which other countries uh, Failure or success in managing their own uh, COVID crises uh, uh, could, be, could be affected if we were uh, better coordinated. There's been a lot of wasted diplomatic capital on uh, blaming China. Again, China deserves a great deal of criticism for how it managed and was not transparent about the origins of the virus. But uh, to send, send the United States into the UN Security Council or meetings of the G7 or G20 and make the main focus of their diplomacy to get other countries to adopt terms like China virus or Wuhan virus instead of an actual practical plan for suppressing the virus uh, makes no sense. And, and a real lack of leadership on ensuring uh, that there is coordination in the search for a vaccine or providing support to developing countries who simply don't have the resources to manage a crisis like this when it hits them. And then of course could bounce back uh, to other countries uh, later. So. That's been a, certainly, I think, a, a failed course uh, of action. On a smaller scale, there have been some limited international successes. Uh, the EU did pull together a number, uh, quite a number of countries, uh, European and other countries, Israel was one of them, to participate in a consortium that will pool uh, research uh, findings toward uh, a vaccine for COVID. Israel, Israel participated in that. And then there's this very interesting group of, of middle powers uh, that Israel is a part of with Austria, Australia, New Zealand, Denmark, Greece, and the Czech Republic, seven or eight countries of similar size that have all uh, been fairly effective in the ways uh, Rivka just described uh, in uh, managing and suppressing the curve in their own countries. And they have gotten together several times now, virtually of course, uh, to do uh, sh share best practices, solutions that have been effective. Uh, they're even talking about setting up once, uh, if they can sustain the, the, the lower curve, uh, some kind of closed loop of travel between countries that have a low rate of infection so that people could actually start to breathe and, uh, and move outside their country. So there have been some smaller scale international coordination successes. The large ones have largely been unsuccessful and, and it's largely due to the absence of U.S. leadership. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, or you don't. We, don't know, we don't know much uh, about why the virus hit hard, certain countries and certain countries were spared of, of the virus in some way. Um, it may have something to do with the climate, it may have something to do with the age, but what we do see, uh, to continue what Ambassador Shapiro started with, um, on, the, on the positive side, we do see 
exactly the kind of thing that we spoke about when we launched the Charney Forum a New Diplomacy, which is citizen diplomacy. What you see today is universities, they're not waiting for their governments. Scientists, they're not waiting for their governments. Only the other day, three brilliant Israeli scientists, uh, one from Tel Aviv U and two from Weizmann Institute, published an article in the New York Times that suggested a very simple way to go back into work. Uh, this is all happening. Uh, again, Yael Lavi spoke about uh, citizen journalism. That's exactly what's happening now. People are sharing information. We are an unprecedented level of hyper-connectivity and it is largely a positive experience. So when you ask me on the positive side, it's already happening. The collaboration is already happening. Uh, of course, on the, on the failed course of action, I would say that um, um, the, the, the COVID-19 um, exposed the lack of trust. Now, there's a very interesting psychological phenomenon here. What happens to a political leader or a CEO or to that extent a, a leader of a company that know that their constituency doesn't trust them? From a psychological point of view, they will always take the harsh measure the harshest measure in order to cover themselves. We see it time and again in the behavior of political leaders. Yael referred to the fact that some political leaders saw this as a, as a photo op. This, the crisis was an opportunity for them to put themselves again at, 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 the, at the center and not, not one leader and not two leaders. Uh, many leaders throughout the world did that. And so I think that the, um, that the system is broken. I foresee the political system is broken. I, definitely um, foresee as a result of the devastation, the economic devastation that was brought about by the crisis, a major dramatic political change. Uh, I think that the upcoming elections in the United States will give us a very solid indication as to the general direction. Uh, and even in places like Israel, where the, vir the virus was, uh, at least the perception is that it was handled well, I think that the repercussions will be uh, long-term, strategic, and very, very deep, far and wide. Thank you. Uh, Yuri. Hold on, you're still muted. Friends here. Now, now start. All right. I'm risking antagonizing some of my friends here, but uh, here goes nothing. For me, it is first and foremost a leadership issue. In times of crisis, one can tell who's a leader and who is at best a talented manager. And leaders see beyond sophisticated Excel sheets. They empower the teams and the organization stakeholders and are very good in harvesting and processing ever-changing information, making decisions surrounded by endless moving parts. Uh, let me share with you the following. In the midst of the crisis, I had fascinating discussions with two different NGOs, both supporting similar causes, children with special needs. But it was like they live in two different realities. The first CEO I was talking to actively changed the current programs, decided to offer parents, which is very unusual for him, online consultation as new methods of treatment, approached donors and raised funds for laptops and internet packages for families who could not afford it, and reduced his stuff in a very, very minimal way. He is, he is an unbelievable leader. The second CEO, dealing with similar issues, told me she had sent everyone home, her words, including herself, saving costs, and is awaiting a better tomorrow. Now, if she's awaiting a better tomorrow, I don't know who will deliver it to her. So you see similar challenges, different leadership, and different tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, well, first of all, there's a underlying theme that actually is, um, uh, is coming up with all the speakers. And I, I'm going to agree also with Ambassador Shapir about the strong need of leadership. And if you ask about the sphere of journalism and content, apropos, yes, there is a feeling right now, obviously, in the world that there is no one guided line, one, dare I say, superpower that's leading the charge and thinking for all of us. But there's, it also seems to be the case in, in the sphere of journalism and content. There was a big discussion over the course of the last two months, both in American newsrooms and a little in Israeli newsrooms about, do you broadcast, um, you know, just live straight to audiences? Because he asked, 
what was the fail of this period. You broadcast those live um, uh, press conferences from the White House, or so let's say from whenever the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, I'm taking the airtime at 8.30, do you do that? Now, back in the day, an editor, apropos a leader, apropos somebody in charge, an editor could make that decision to say, you know what, this is of no actual value to the listener. We're going to actually look at this while it's going live at the back room, take what we need from it, and then report it. So if something like a leader of a country standing on a stage suggesting that people inject you know, Clorox into their veins happens, you do not broadcast it because that's dangerous. That's actual dangerous dissemination of information. So we didn't see that happening, that infiltration of a responsible editorial presence that says, okay, even if this is making me a lot of money in ratings, I'm not just going to put that on the air. I hope that'll change. Somebody will probably ask, you know, how do we see citizen journalism rising out of this occasion? Because at the end of the day, you know, you still have the so-called mainstream outlets. I really, I want to promise people looking at this that I'm not the only one when I start looking at a story, which is what I did here, that I start looking at the greater picture of all these things that are available to me through the digital world. And by that, I mean, right now we are checking our own sources, our own information. If I read something on Facebook, which is, you know, sadly right now, social media is the new frontier when it comes to journalism, I know I need to go and check it in other outlets. Just like when I saw something on Fox, I would go and check the, the, the opposing point of view on MSNBC because everything is politically filtered and we are becoming our own editors. I do think this is a reality though that is possible. Also via technology when it comes to journalism because even speaking of blockchain, Noah will smile right now, the ability technologically to verify information is being developed right now. And by that, I mean information as in journalism, saying you're laying you know, input to a society in a democratic state. I want to hope that we'll see that. But I do think that one thing I miss seeing is a news outlet anywhere in the world looking to the citizens saying, we really don't know right now what is true and what is not, even from a scientific point of view. This is a virus that is just going throughout the world right now, and we're reacting. Nobody said that in a calm way, as simple as it sounds. And that's something I would like to hope and see in the event that there's a second wave. Let's hope that there is no second wave. There we go. Thank you. So before I start the third question, I am going to ask the speakers, uh, good luck to them and me, if you can make your short answers a bit shorter, just because I want to be able to get all, um, we have two more questions, and I want to leave time for um, all of you of the participants to ask some questions. Please just write them in the chat, and we will select them. So at the Charney Forum, uh, we address the dramatic disruption, as I mentioned in the beginning, that has occurred in diplomacy, a shift from G to G, government to government, to P to P, people to people. Could you please provide an example, briefly, from your area of expertise about this change, the move from government to people to people? Yeah, El, we'll start with you. Um, wow. Um, for, for, well, first of all, you know, the, the beginning of this government, from government to government, from people to people, uh, you know, I like to trash usually, from the, for those who know me, I know I, I, I have an issue with social media as the new form of journalism. But at the end of the day, that's also how we reach each other in different scenarios and different situations if we break through the, what we call the echo chamber of social media and journalism and get to other sources and other contexts. We've seen that happen over the course of the last several more of the last several months. We've seen that also in the fact that, you know, in this day and age, when it comes to journalism, you don't really need a mass platform. You know, all you need is this. And you can report from anywhere and everywhere and get your story out, you know, no matter if you're in a dictatorship or in a, you know, or in a democracy or in a wannabe democracy, you can get your story out. And that's the great change that we've seen in my profession, at least, yet to be utilized on a fuller scale, I would say, of citizen journalism, because sadly, nobody has figured out yet how to monetize on it, but yet to be taken into a bigger platform of citizen journalism, which is, at the essence, people to people sharing information, which is what I would like to see coming out of this crisis. Thank you, and good for you. A minute to spare. Yariv, you're next. <laughs> I think I'm going to uh, echo uh, Ambassador Zaroni and say, let's talk about the single most important factor during crisis management, and the magic word is trust. Therefore, during the crisis, whom do we trust? The citizens, the central government, the local authorities, NGOs, my own community, it's all a blur sometimes. The second factor is solidarity. During his presidential campaign, Bill Clinton used to say, I feel your pain. And it came through very authentically. 
I'm asking myself now as a citizen, does the government feel the pain? Does it show solidarity? Who lends a hand to the less fortunate groups in our society, especially in this, uh, in this time of crisis? Uh, COVID-19 pro proved once again the agility of some non-governmental players, while the government fails to address their acute social challenges fast enough. Uh, NGOs, as well as many individuals and businesses, are playing a huge role right now in showing solidarity and are much more quick to react and attentive to, if you want to call it collateral damage, than the uh, central government. So the short answer is that the new world, which would emerge, would be a mix of official and non-official bodies working even closer uh, for the public good. Philanthropists will become even more engaged in the charities on one hand, but will demand more business-oriented and outcomes-based approach on the other hand. Governments would have to listen more and cooperate more closely than before with the civil society of all kinds. And this will be an embodiment of the shift that we see and, and we spoke about it previously. We see the shift from a government, uh, from government to non-government approach in the new diplomacy. Thank you, Yuri. Ambassador Aroni. So the, um, you know, the area of diplomacy was disrupted in a very big way. Um, most of the traditional tasks of the occupational diplomat uh, were disrupted. For example, uh, the diplomat is an advocate of a, of a policy and a representative of a policy. This was taken away a long time ago by political leaders that are able to communicate above the heads of the public directly to their constituents. Also view the civil service as a threat um, or fighting the traditional elites from media to the intellectual circles, um, all in, the, in one, you know, all part of that one big disruption, eliminating the mediators, the people that used to communicate reality to us, the pundits of the, of the past, you know, if to use um, uh, Yael's uh, terms, the, um, the echo chamber is a, is a big game changer in diplomacy. Uh, the diplomat as an analyst was taken away by the proliferation of information uh, provided, very accessible, very easy to use. Things that used to take two weeks are now taking five minutes thanks to all the sophisticated search engines and the precision searches and so on. The diplomat as a negotiator, again, gone, gone with the wind. The political leaders confiscated that too, and we see that in, the, in their behavior. They see themselves as, um, as the ultimate negotiators. They don't trust their civil service. They don't trust their, their staff at times. Uh, people find it very difficult to survive around political leaders. And then obviously the rise in the importance of cities. When diplomacy was, was designed during the, the days of the Renaissance, uh, it was uh, mostly, it started actually in cities, but then it became what we call bilateral, meaning it's a nation to nation. While today, especially post COVID-19, we all realize that the most important economic, social, cultural, and political unit is the city. Governments don't know what to do with cities. I'll give you just one little indication. Uh, when uh, Israeli foreign minister wanted to convene the most important heads of missions in Jerusalem for a periodical discussion, he asked the Israeli uh, senior official to come up with a list of the most important um, embassies, missions, not embassies, missions. He came up with 19 missions. New York was not included. When I called him up and I asked, how come New York is not one of the most important places in the world? He said, well, New York is covered by Washington, D.C. That's traditional diplomacy. Another example is, of course, the city of Seattle, one of the most important cities of the world, not covered by any foreign government. So the new diplomat, and I will conclude with that, will have to become the chief marketing officer of her or his country or her or his place, rather than just being the advocate. And this is really, in essence, new diplomacy. Thank you. Ambassador Shapiro. Um, for me, I think it's, um, it's certainly, uh, and from my own experience of the social media, you know, with, it, as I was coming to be an ambassador in Israel in 2011, um, I had a Facebook account. I don't think I'd ever used it. I did not have a Twitter account. Uh, I was afraid of using these uh, mediums to communicate. I was afraid of making mistakes. 
Uh, I wasn't sure anybody would pay attention to them. We were strongly encouraged by the State Department then uh, under Secretary of State Clinton, later Kerry, and, and certainly President Obama understood the power of these new tools. You have to remember, this is less than really a decade ago that uh, an ambassador uh, or an embassy or a foreign government using a social media platform to explain what it was doing uh, and to communicate with the public was really uh, considered very avant-garde and even a bit risky and, and, and maybe even a bit uh, renegade. Uh, nevertheless, it's now obviously a, 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 an essential tool or essential set of tools to communicate with publics. And to communicate with publics, I think that's the key part of it. It's not just government to government communication anymore. It is government to public communication, but that also then facilitates co co uh, uh, communication between publics uh, as well. Uh, and of course, it starts with Facebook and Twitter, but now then you have to have Instagram. And then if you don't have Snapchat, you're really left out. And then if you don't have TikTok, how are you possibly going to reach the younger uh, generation? Uh, so you have to be nimble. Uh, you have to uh, learn the skills of these different platforms. You have to reach people where they are. And there also has to be the willingness to, to make it a two-way dialogue, not just a simply one-way projection uh, of, of views. Otherwise, it's, uh, it quickly loses credibility. So to me, these are still evolving tools. Our understanding of how to use them is still evolving. But it's definitely empowering for uh, publics or individuals uh, who can make their voice heard and heard by governments and even engage in a conversation uh, with diplomats in a way they never could before. Thank you. Dr. Carmi. First, first, very early on, I think we envisioned how globalization shrink down to nations and communities. You know, we were asking for medical supplies. Uh, everybody needed those medical supplies. And at the end of the day, you know, everybody was to its own. Globalization wasn't a, even a word. So I think this is one of the uh, lessons to take from this crisis. Uh, a country should be very self-sufficient in this regard and not rely in a, in a crisis, in, in a pan crisis, in a crisis of, uh, you know, international crisis like that, not to rely on any other country. So globalization on one hand, but when it comes to really, you know, to crucial needs, that everybody to his home to his own. Uh, the other observation, on the other hand, is how medicine and research actually uh, became extremely global, extremely global, you know? Um, and, and, and the fact that what we say always that the medicine and research is beyond borders, is borderless, actually became very, very apparent now. You know, information was streaming on an hour basis. Um, physicians were communicating with each other on, on diagnostics and therapies and, you know, symptoms and, you know, it, it's a situation of, of so much things that were unknown. This kind of, of, uh, of personal communication between people that didn't know each other from before actually uh, helped a lot. In, uh, in treating and handling um, uh, people in, in, a, in an environment where the unknown was more than, than, than uh, known. Um, what, what can I say, what, what I should say about it is that also the, um, the, uh, the journals that usually do not publish at all, you know, case reports or small series, they, all, they, all, they go for the big stuff. Nowadays, almost all of them had provided open access um, uh, publications. So people could really enter into any, you know, very known high profile uh, journal and get information uh, which, you know, uh, some of it uh, proved to be, you know, uh, nothing really serious, but some of them really opened the way to also collaborative research. So people are, are uh, now teaming up together, not only exchanging information, but doing research together on therapies, diagnostics, and, and immunizations. And as I see it, this is this will this will uh, stay with us. Some things obviously will disappear with time, but this time of collaboration, which proves to be so efficient, uh, so contributing. Uh, this is this will last. So if you want P2P and the fact that the government was not involved 
and, and, and was not, you know, to any extent uh, officer in this, this was very, very positive and this was very helpful because if the government would have, had, would have intervened, uh, we couldn't do what people to people did this time. Thank you. So I have one final question and I still want to try and cram a question or two from uh, the audience. So with everyone's permission, we may go like five, seven minutes over, but let's, let's, we'll, we'll get going. So Winston Churchill famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And indeed, every crisis serves as an opportunity. And some of this came up with some of you. So if, just briefly, you can share even one opportunity that you identify at this point in time as a result of COVID-19, that would be great. And we'll start with Ambassador Shapiro. I'm glad the quote is properly attributed to Winston Churchill. In the Obama White House, it used to be attributed to Rahm Emanuel. So I think uh, it goes back a little bit further. Uh, my, my opportunity is look at what we're doing now. Uh, we are using technology in a way that most of us were not comfortable, capable, certainly not doing routinely uh, even several weeks ago. Uh, and using it for remote gatherings, using it to be more productive, using it both for personal and for professional purposes. Uh, these tools, again, very much in their infancy uh, in terms of how they can be uh, captured by individuals, by governments, by companies uh, to increase productivity, to improve communication, to share ideas that doesn't need to be restricted to when we're all housebound because of a pandemic. It can be adapted in many ways when we are freed from our our current restrictions. So I think the opportunity I see of capturing uh, the new communication tools that now are wide fluency uh, in, and comfort uh, for use by people who previously were not using them uh, is an opportunity that we're really uh, very early on understanding how we can how we can fully exploit. Thank you, Dr. Carmi. Hold on, you're muted. Maya, okay, there we go. Oh. So, one very local opportunity and the other one local in general. And, and the local one is an opportunity to really bring together Israeli and is, uh, Jewish and Israeli uh, Arabs. You know, the fact that uh, the, uh, the health and, and medicine staff was depicted now uh, with so many doctors, nurses, technicians, all kind of medical personnel working together, you know, hand in hand, uh, day and night, actually bring up, brought across something very, very strong that people tend not to realize and recognize on a daily basis. So I do hope that this is an opportunity for, you know, bringing together these two uh, communities in a very robust way, other than in medicine, uh, and health. And the other one, with your permission, is uh, an opportunity to promote women mm -hmm. to leading uh, top executive um, positions. You know, there are almost no women whatsoever dealing with this crisis, not in the Ministry of Health, not around the, the uh, Prime uh, Minister, etc. And I think this is really unfortunate because, first of all, it was already proven worldwide that women are dealing better with crises, much better. And also there is a proof now on the, you know, the, you know that those countries that are led by, uh, by women had a much better performance in uh, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. So we have all the evidence there. Something should be done about it. And Israel has now an opportunity because there is a new Minister of Health. He's going to bring a new CEO for, the, uh, for the, uh, the ministry. And we do hope, and we actually are working hard to bring a woman to this senior position. And I think it should be in Israel, but also worldwide. I have to say amen to that. <laughs> yeah, El. Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, um, yes, just because I'm also speaking from Israel, I think the fact that there are 23 men 
on the Israeli and Internal Security Committee working on an exit strategy in Israel in 2020, irrespective of a pandemic, is ludicrous. So let's hope that changes. And, and you know, God knows this is an opportunity for that. But yeah, apropos this crisis, I think we're in the midst of it still. And I think only time will tell. But one thing that I tend to agree with all my esteemed um, uh, panelists on this one is that the fact that we can share information ourselves is becoming more um, prevalent and becoming um, uh, more out there to the greater public, to citizens. Apropos education, one of the things that I'm I say excited but hopeful about when it's coming out of this crisis with this technology is that anybody has access to education, which was the original idea, I think, of the internet at the beginning. And truly, in, in that respect, and we know that there are so many gaps in society everywhere and all around, but this is a great opportunity to share information, get education to everyone. Also, furthermore, journalism, my profession, has been in a crisis over the course of the last, I think, five to seven years. Social media is amazing as a platform to disseminate out more information, but who the heck is checking it? That's what the job of the editor, in this case, you know, that one entity that controls, be it the Zuckerbergs or the, um, uh, or the Jack Dorseys of the world, they have the power to regulate information on their platform. Needless to say, we're coming up to a very important election, November 2020 in the United States. One of the things that scares me a lot is that within those platforms, that is where people get their information and nobody is monitoring what is true and what is um, not true. I think that will change. I think given the fact that we have seen such a, you know, a need to regulate information, and regulate is a big word, but maybe possibly let's turn it into a regulate the ethical dissemination of information around the you know, democracies around the world. That's something that people, media companies, one would hope so, or citizen journalists at least, understand at this point and will understand going forward. Thank you. Yuri. So we are talking opportunities here. Uh, I strongly believe that um, Side by side with traditional philanthropy, Tikkun Olam and Tzedakah, more and more funders would be open to the concept of impact philanthropy and outcomes-based philanthropy, in which every charitable dollar can unlock more than the traditional same level support from the government or other part. You know, this is the classical matching system we, we grew up on as fundraisers. Uh, I believe that philanthropy is to join impact investors, really investors, to tackle social issues, as philanthropy and public funding alone are just not enough and we see it every day now. This is the right modern way to leverage philanthropy with new funds, where the matching can be much higher than one to one and we unfortunately we don't have time this evening to discuss it uh, in depth, the concept. However, and this is somewhat tricky to most NGOs I've been working with for the last 25 years, they must understand as well that alongside the traditional fundraising strategies and, and techniques or tactics, they should adopt impact orientation supported by hard facts and numbers. Uh, both donors and recipients should stop asking, how many kids have I sent to math clubs? And ask how many program participants passed the matriculation exam in math at the highest level with at least A minus, let's say. Don't count how many college students receive direct financial support check how many of these supported students graduated finally and were placed in high paying positions in the job market. This is the real test. This blended model of philanthropy, where philanthropists are conditioning the gift on measurable, in advance agreed upon outcomes, could be a key factor in the survival and bouncing back strategy for many NGOs. And it takes true leadership of these social players to change the course of the ship, but it is essential if you want to navigate through stormy water and reach safe harbor. The alternative is crashing on the rocks, abandoned ship, and sinking of crew and cargo. We don't want that. Thank you. And finally, Ambassador. Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the, the devastation, the economic devastation, is unprecedented. Uh, there are countries that uh, it will take them years to recover from this uh, devastation. So. To me, the main opportunity is in the adoption of what we call flexible economy. Flexible economy is the kind of economy that you implement uh, in times of severe and unprecedented crisis, very similar to the American New Deal of the 1930s and 1940s. The ability to pour tremendous and imaginary amounts of money into the economy, to invest in infrastructure, to do all the things that were previously considered as experimental or too expensive uh, to engage in, um, in, in, as I said before, 
collaborative form of business, collaborative form of diplomacy, collaborative form of foreign policy, all the things that are counterintuitive to the political leader, to the CEO, to the business leader, and so on. So to me, that's the opportunity. I think that uh, specifically, we will see a very rapid change um, in, in what we call the, the future of work. What does it mean to have a job? Uh, very rapid change to what we call gig economy, freelance-based economy. Um, I know that from my own family that Google already told its own employees that they're not, coming, they're not coming back to work in the office until at least the end of the year, uh, which, is, um, which is a strong statement about what is really the value of uh, bringing all these people together un under one roof when they can actually work and maybe even be more productive uh, uh, from the comfort of their own private homes. But again, bottom line to me, the opportunity here is to do all the things that we previously thought that were impossible to do. Um, and and I, I think the best example is the American New Deal. We need a new New Deal. Thank you. So we're supposed to finish right now, but we have such amazing speakers and I think everyone's still very interested. So without your permission, I'm gonna steal another five top 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna start with a question that Benji Maor asks. Uh, how do you all think the crisis will impact Israeli diaspora relations, not only in regards to philanthropy, what strategic opportunities might there be, if any? And I'll let anyone who wants to jump on that. Someone who spent many years at the forefront of that, of that relationship. Um, yeah, I think everybody's hurt. Philanthropists are hurt too. So therefore they have less money. And I think that the model will have to uh, to be different. Um, instead of top down, it will have to be bottom up, meaning um, institutions will have to make an appeal to a much larger base of donors, expect them to engage in a relationship that is based on the strength of their brand. I think there are many, many good examples to that already happening in Jewish life. One of the examples, I just um, will mention one organization, not because I have any specific relationship with them, is the Jewish National Fund. 20 years ago, the Jewish National Fund was selling uh, this, the, the, the old uh, geopolitical conversation about who's right and who's wrong in the conflict and all that baloney. And they raised uh, the flag of the environment about 20 years ago. They went from $5 million campaign a year to $140 million a year. Uh, this is the JNF, one of the fastest growing organizations to prove the point that you need to change the model. You need to have a strong brand. You need to make um, a strong appeal and you have to be relevant. Most um, Jewish organizations are focusing on the hardships. It's nice. I'm not sure it's going to be relevant. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a free for all. The, Maya opened all your mics, the, the speakers, the panelists. But I think Ambassador Shapiro, you wanted to go? Well, I'll just say that there's a, a serious uh, funding crisis, obviously, for many Jewish institutions in the United States, uh, particularly some of the most effective in terms of building uh, Jewish identity, which is summer camps, who uh, some of them will not operate this year. Many may not operate this year. And uh, it's very hard for institutions like that to survive a year without the revenue, uh, their main revenue source. So some won't survive. Uh, uh, we may need to look for new institutions or ways to replace what those institutions are providing. One of them, of course, that's always been effective is in uh, getting young people to travel to Israel. Uh, and uh, there may be opportunities to actually expand that uh, and fund it differently. I will say uh, it's a very strange moment for the government of Israel to consider doing something that would be very alienating to many uh, diaspora Jews, uh, or at least American Jews, uh, such as uh, annexation, uh, unilateral annexation in the West Bank. So it's a, a, one of many reasons uh, that I think uh, the government here uh, should probably think very long and hard before it rushes forward with that, uh, with that uh, step that would be true at any time. But at this time, when you know, there's this uh, additional uh, crisis of maybe that will go to people's identity and their, the means they have to, to express it and, and express support for Israel in different ways, uh, it's a very, very, uh, uh, to me, short-sighted decision. From a media point of view, it would be a disaster as well. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Anyone else for that? I'm going to ask just one more question. 
Uh, so Keith Kravitsky um, asks, how do we ever get, and this is really a very, very easy question to answer, how do we ever get to a shared understanding of issues or challenges? Doesn't this lead to even more polarization and fragmentation? And what is the alternative? <laughs> if, if I may, I don't think we need to get to a shared understanding. I think we need to allow the other person or the other group across from us to have their point of view. I think that's where we're standing right now. Because at the end of the day, they, you know, what we're striving for, and especially, I think, you know, throughout a medical crisis, we need the pluralism of thought. You know, that's what happens throughout an experiment. We need the pluralism of thought also throughout, you know, delivering information and content. And definitely through diplomacy and government, we need the pluralism of thought and, you know, and the ability to allow, as simple as it sounds, the people across from us to have an opinion. To do that, though, we need also media outlets to deliver a vast array of opinions. That said, again, I want to keep this on an optimistic note as we're sitting here and Israel is coming out of lockdown, granted, you know, into a government that needed, you know, three election runs and one world pandemic to be signed. But that said, I think people are beginning to have an understanding, from my point of view, in my sphere, that information doesn't have just one source and cannot just be one point, one source point to get your information from. Definitely from the children or the kids, I call them kids, they're 22, that I teach, there is that understanding that information right now in the transformation digital age that we're in is something that they have to depend on themselves to go on and get a vast array of pluralistic thought for themselves to find those. Thank you. Does anyone else want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, I would just, just want to say one thing. I think that uh, counterintuitively, Israel will become even more attractive in the eyes of young Jews from all over the world because of the way, or at least the perception of the way that the crisis was handled. We have to remember the context. Zionism has never been more popular than it is today. Between 1850, 1925, two and a half million Jews left Eastern Europe to North America, US and Canada. Only 80,000 of them came to Palestine, including my family. Zionism was never hot among Jews. It was never popular among Jews. It has never been more popular than it is today. And there are many reasons for it. I think birthright has a lot to do with it. And, um, and I think that Israel, strangely and oddly, will become even more popular among young Jews. We see now a whole new phenomenon of young people coming to Israel, not because like their grandparents, they see Israel as a place of problems, plagued with with insurmountable challenges. They see Israel for the first time in the history of Zionism as a place of opportunity where they can feel, okay, where they can fulfill their own dreams. We've never had that before. And I think it will be even stronger post COVID-19 um, as, as strange as it may sound. Okay, so I'm gonna, oh, sorry. Yes, Dr. Carmen. A question. Can I, can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> So obviously, Ido, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that you're right and this will happen. It will make me very happy. My question is, you know, uh, in view of the facts that, uh, that some of, uh, of what's happening in New York in the neighborhood here comes from the Jewish community, the Haredi community, uh, outrageous behavior. How do you see, you know, the attitude towards the uh, Jewish community uh, and maybe through in Israel, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these kind of uh, of happenings. Is I don't know. Question. No, or or then. Well, I will let Ambassador Shapiro to answer that. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, two diplomats. We're never going to have this end. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think. I don't think it will. Uh, I don't think it will have any dramatic change. Um, um, I don't think it will impact. Look. It's very misleading to count the number of anti-Semitic incidents. That's not the way you measure the integration of a society. Um, again, um, I tend to be very, I look at the big picture. The Jews have never had it better in the United States. The Jews have never had it better in many other places. But certainly when we speak about the United States, it was never more in to be Jewish. Um, it was never more acceptable in popular culture to be Jewish. Um, my father-in-law could not, could not get into Harvard University, um, and uh, my wife is from the United States. And so um, I, I don't think it will dramatically change the positioning of Jews in the United States. I think uh, it's a success story. It's not going to change that. Um, and again, 
post-November elections, we will know a lot more about the general direction that the United States is heading. I think this is perhaps the most critical election campaign in many, many decades in the history of the United States. Couldn't, couldn't agree with that more. I was gonna say, I'm, gonna, you, <laughs> I'm sure you wanna chime in. <laughs> No, I, I, I couldn't agree with that more. I think we, uh, we have uh, some uh, major challenges in our uh, own society uh, about uh, whether we will uh, go in a direction of extreme polarization uh, or whether we will return to some kind of, uh, of, of sort of con common consensual uh, American identity. Uh, and I think the choices are very, very stark in that regard. But I think it, it bears uh, even more heavily in some ways on uh, the United States influence internationally. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's good for any of our allies, including Israel, uh, for the United States to withdraw from the world, to think only about America first, uh, to be divided uh, and kind of at uh, Americans at each other's throats, uh, whether it's over religious or, or cultural or economic or social uh, divides. Uh, I think uh, the world suffers, uh, our allies suffer, and obviously the United States suffers uh, when that goes on. So there's an awful lot at stake. I agree with you, though. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap it up because uh, I, I really wanted to end on time, but I think 10 minutes late with uh, five speakers is uh, an achievement in and of itself. And I think this really is only uh, opens up the appetite. I don't know if you say that in English, but I just did. Um, but it really is the beginning of a conversation. And I want to thank so much everyone for joining and our distinguished speakers, Ambassador Shapiro, Ambassador Aroni, Yariv Sultan, Professor Dr. Rifka Karmi, and award-winning journalist Yael Lavi. It's been amazing having you. I think we need to, from here, do one-on-ones with each and every one of you. Um, I do wanna ask everyone to please go to the link. I know for some people it wasn't working, but just try, and if not, we'll send one later. It's a, I promise it's a two-minute feedback form. It just helps us get a sense of uh, if we're doing things right and where we wanna go. I do also wanna take this opportunity to thank uh, Ido for his vision and Celie for her vision and also for their, her unwavering support. It's, uh, it's, it's what's made this all possible. And uh, of course, to also thank my staff that's made this possible, Maya Fint and Einat Hakim. Um, there was a lot of hard work behind this and I'm glad that uh, it was almost flawless. Um, please continue to follow us on our Facebook, our LinkedIn, we launched as, Many of you know an interview series. Everyone here, all of the speakers tonight were already interviewed and their interviews were published, but we have many more to come. Uh, so please check it out on our YouTube channel and on our website. And we look forward to uh, hearing more and having such stimulating conversations. Thank you, everyone. And of course, keep safe wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.